The Beatles' Abbey Road Medley, a collection of songs that has to be one of the most integral moments in rock and roll history. You Never Give Me Your Money, Sun King, and so many more unfinished songs strung together brilliantly to create the iconic end to one of the Beatles' most celebrated albums. Today, it gives me great joy to show you 10 very interesting facts about the Beatles' Abbey Road Medley, the long one. Kicking off the Abbey Road medley in perfect Beatles fashion is, wouldn't you know, a micro medley containing three unfinished songs Paul McCartney had composed. For the sake of clarity, we'll title these pieces You Never Give Me Your Money, Out of College, and One Sweet Dream. Unlike John Lennon and George Harrison, Paul didn't usually write songs about his life specifically. Yes, of course, he did make a few like Hey Jude for John's son Julian and Penny Lane about his childhood. But while John had songs like In My Life, A Day in the Life, and Julia touching upon deep-rooted personal experiences, Paul enjoyed concentrating on creative narratives that were fictitious. Paul's lyricism wasn't often literal, and he recalls George Harrison commenting on Paul's ability to author a story from nothing, stating, I remember George once saying to me, I couldn't write songs like that. He writes more from personal experience. John's style was to show the naked truth. If I was a painter, I'd probably mask things a little bit more than some people. But during the time of Abbey Road, with an imminent disbanding looming for the Beatles, Paul elects to take a more literal approach to You Never Give Me Your Money, which is a direct reference to the business turmoil the lads were going through in 1969, with a bit of a mask to hide anything overt. After marrying Linda Eastman in March 1969 and spending three weeks in New York meeting his new in-laws in April that year, Paul begins to tune about his perspective on money troubles. Paul says, this was me directly lambasting Alan Klein's attitude to us. No money, just funny paper, all promises, and it never works out. It's basically a song about no faith in the person that found its way into the medley on Abbey Road. John saw the humor in it. George Harrison continues this explanation of funny paper, saying, That's what we get. We get bits of paper saying how much we earned and what this and that is, but we never actually get it in pounds, shillings, and pence. We've all got a big house and a car and office, but to actually get the money we've earned seems impossible. You never give me your money is, I think, all these business meetings that we had to go through to sort out the past. It came out in Paul's song. The second segment of the song, Out of College, goes on to comment on the success of the Beatles and their ascension into fame and fortune, getting the sack from a job you despise and the magic feeling of finally attaining your dreams. On Paul's original lyrics scrolled on a piece of paper, we can see that nowhere to go is spelled with a K, for no, like knowing where to go. Indicating out of the misery of business issues, Paul finds a silver lining and thus leads us into the most uplifting part of the song, One Sweet Dream, which just has the most fantastic story behind it. Shifting gear and quite literally getting away this segment of the song depicts a true habit of Paul and Linda as they quite enjoyed getting into a car on their own and getting lost in the countryside to escape London. Linda concurs by saying, as a kid I love getting lost. I would say to my father, let's get lost. Then when I moved to England to be with Paul, we would put Martha in the back of the car and drive out of London. As soon as we were on the open road I'd say, let's get lost and we'd keep driving without looking at any signs. And finally, the little phrase, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all good children go to heaven, is a children's jump rope rhyme that was certainly around during the Beatles' childhoods, but it could have easily been inspired by Linda's daughter, Heather, to Paul. The full poem goes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all good children go to heaven. When you get there, God will say, where's that book you stole away? If you say, I don't know, he will send you down below, where everything is red hot peppers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all good children go to heaven. When you get there, angels say, your school name, children, right this way. Being perhaps the inception of the idea for George Harrison's Here Comes the Sun, while John could be heard in the studio singing Here Comes the Sun, Whoa, the Sun, on the proto version of Sun King, before George had written Here Comes the Sun, John had been working on Sun King for weeks, but it just never found itself complete as their schedule was full to the brim. Songwriting time must have been very hard to find for the Beatles. Serendipitously, Paul inquires if John had any partial unfinished songs for his medley concept on the second side of Abbey Road. John agrees, mentioning it just seemed like the easier option than attempting to actually finish it, John says. It was just half a song I had, which I had never finished. 
which was one way of getting rid of it without ever finishing it. Then in the medley, we just wanted a change of atmosphere. And here comes the Sun King, why not? And here he comes, and everybody's happy, and quando para mucho, etc. Not without mentioning later that it was, quote, a piece of garbage I had laying around. John had alluded to the idea that the song came to him in a dream, not uncommon for a Beatles, seeing that Let It Be came to Paul in his dreams. John, being an avid reader, was perhaps influenced by Nancy Mitford's book entitled The Sun King. It's possible John, after reading the book, dreamt of the king in his palace, seeing everyone laughing, everyone happy. A fan favorite of the song is the use of Spanish interludes full of errant phrases the lads knew. John says, you know, singing cuando para mucho, so we just made it up. Paul knew a few Spanish words from school, you know. So we just strung any Spanish words that sounded vaguely like something. And of course, we got Chica Ferdi in. That's a Liverpool expression. Just like sort of, it doesn't mean anything. Just like na 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 na. Chica Ferdi is a Scouse dialect phrase, as John said, to taunt other children. Paul hilariously remarks on this term by saying, there was a thing in Liverpool that us kids used to do, which is instead of saying fuck off, we would say Chica Ferdi. In that song, we just kind of made up things, and we were all in on the joke. We were thinking that nobody would know what it meant, and most people would think, oh, it must be Spanish, or something. But we got a little seditious word in there. Written in the spring of 1968 in India by John, Mean Mr. Mustard was actually in consideration for the Beatles' previous White Album, but never made it there. Instead, it found itself recorded back to back with Sun King. I personally adore this song, which I'm sure many of you do as well. However, John really didn't seem to feel the same way as you'll see in this next quote. John says, In Mean Mr. Mustard, I said his sister Pam. Originally, it was his sister Shirley in the lyric. I changed it to Pam to make it sound like it had something to do with polythene Pam. They are only finished bits of crap that I wrote in India. That's me, writing a piece of garbage. I'd read somewhere in the newspaper about this mean guy who had five pound notes, not up his nose, but somewhere else. No, it had nothing to do with cocaine. In that article, we can see direct lyrical influences such as this excerpt that John must have read. Mean husband who shaved and went to bed in the dark to save light. He also insisted that the lights be turned off while he and his wife were listening to the radio because it was not necessary to see in order to listen. Of course, this inspired the lyrics shaves in the dark trying to save paper. Firstly, I don't know what it is about this song, but it's one of my favorite Beatles songs to work out to. It's got such a fantastic groove, really gets you going. But its story is even more intriguing. Again, born in India in 1968 by John, John tells the tale of a sexually liberated woman that was inspired by two separate people. One being Pat Dawson with the sobriquet polythene Pat with a T, and the other was beat poet Royston Ellis' girlfriend Stephanie. How Pat got that nickname has got to be one of the most bizarre facts you'll hear today, probably. Probably. Polythene is plastic, and well, Pat liked to eat plastic. She was also an early adopter and friend of the Beatles when she was a child. Pat says, I started going to see the Beatles in 1961 when I was 14 and got quite friendly with them. If they were playing out of town, they'd give me a lift back home in their van. It was about the same time that I started getting called Polythene Pat. It's embarrassing, really. I just used to eat polythene all the time. I tie it into knots and then eat it. Sometimes I even used to burn it and then eat it when it got cold. Then I had a friend who got a job in a polythene bag factory, which was wonderful because it meant I had a constant supply. Okay. <laughs> and the second was a bit more, shall we say, fetishy. John remarks on meeting poet Royston Ellis and his girlfriend, Stephanie, for what might have been a particularly groovy night for John. John says, that was me, remembering a little event with a woman and a man who was England's answer to Allen Ginsberg, who gave us our first exposure. This is so long. You can't deal with all of this. You see, everything triggers amazing memories. I met him when we were on tour, and he took me back to his apartment. And I had a girl, and he had one he wanted me to meet. He said she dressed in polythene, which she did. She didn't wear jackboots and kilts, I just sort of elaborated. Perverted sex in a polythene bag, just looking for something to write about. In August 1963, the couple invited John to their apartment and the three wore polythene and shared a bed for that evening. But before you start getting ideas, this quote by the poet put their evening in better perspective. He says, 
We read all these things about leather and we didn't have any leather, but I had my oilskins and we had some polythene bags from somewhere. We all dressed up in them and wore them in bed. John stayed the night with us in the same bed. I don't think anything very exciting happened. And we all wondered what the fun was in being kinky. It was probably more my idea than John's. Polythene Pam and She Came In Through the Bathroom Window were recorded as one in July 1969, inspired by some mischievous fans known as the Apple Scruffs. When Paul would vacate his London home, these kids would literally break into his house and steal his stuff. Jesus Christ, that's terrifying. Anyway, it's believed that some fans found a ladder in his garden and used it to launch themselves through his bathroom window. On one occasion, stealing a photo that Paul held dear to his heart, he even expressed that he would like it returned because of its sentimental value. I don't think it has been, but I'm not sure. It should also be mentioned that the Moody Blues keyboardist Mike Pinder told Paul a story about a girl sneaking into their bandmates Ray Thomas's room and spending the night with him. Perhaps it's a blend of the two. Furthermore, John Lennon asserts that maybe it was actually about Linda saying, that's Paul's song. He wrote that when we were in New York announcing Apple and we first met Linda. Maybe she's the one that came in through the window. I don't know. Somebody came in through the window. But that's pretty vague. For the quitting of the police department in the song, Paul mentions that after his two week stay in New York in a taxi heading to JFK airport, the final verse just fell in his lap. Paul says, so I got so I quit the police department, which are part of the lyrics to that. This was the great thing about the randomness of it all. If I hadn't been in this guy's cab or if it had been someone else driving, the song would have been different. Also, I had a guitar there so I could solidify it into something straight away. Inspired by an Elizabethan poet, Thomas Decker's poem, Cradle Song, that was in Paul's stepsister Ruth's piano book. Paul begins to put music to the lyrics that weren't in the actual tune because he couldn't read the music. Paul says, I was flicking through it and came to Golden Slumbers. I can't read music and I couldn't remember the old tune. So I just started playing my own tune to it. I liked the words so I kept them and it fitted with another bit of the song I had. That was a 400 year old poem and it was set to music by Peter Warlock in the early 1920s. Recorded together with Golden Slumbers, Carry That Weight was yet another McCartney reference to the issues going on in the group, even though it was just an uproariously uplifting powerhouse of a tune. Paul says, I'm generally quite upbeat, but at certain times things get to me so much I can't be upbeat anymore. And that was one of those times. We were taking so much acid and doing so much drugs and all this Klein shit was going on and getting crazier and crazier and crazier. Carry that weight a long time like forever. That's what I meant. Oh man, this has got to be one of my absolute favorite Beatles song ever. And it really is down to how ecstatic I am over Ringo's drum part. He hated doing drum solos. And to be honest, I'm usually not a big fan of them either, but just the way he composed it was just so special. I mean, you can literally sing this entire drum part. That's not usually the case with drum solos. Without counting Her Majesty, this would have been the final song on the album as the Beatles exit the medley. Jeff Emmerich recalls the work it took to get Ringo to do that drum solo. Jeff said, the thing that always amused me was how much persuasion it took to get Ringo to play that solo. Usually you have to try to talk drummers out of doing solos. He didn't want to do it, but everybody said, no, no, it'll be fantastic. So he gave in and turned in a bloody marvelous performance. It took a while to get right. And I think Paul helped with some ideas, but it's fantastic. I always want to hear more. That's how good it is. It's so musical. It's not just a drummer going off. And we can't forget about the smashing dueling guitar solos. Each one represents of John, George, and Paul's different playing styles. Jeff continues, the idea for guitar solos was very spontaneous and everybody said, yes, definitely. Well, except for George, who was a little apprehensive at first, but he saw how excited John and Paul were, so he went along with it. Truthfully, I think they rather liked the idea of playing together, not really trying to outdo one another per se, but engaging in some real musical bonding. Yoko was about to go into the studio with John. This was commonplace by now. And he actually told her, no, not now. Let me just do this. It'll just take a minute. That surprised me a bit. Maybe he felt like he was returning to his roots with the boys. Who knows? Paul wanted to end the song with something meaningful. So in Shakespearean fashion, he wrote one of the most beautiful pieces of lyrics the Beatles have ever created. And in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. And of course, John Lennon was enamored with that line. But as is the case with John, he couldn't help but get in a little jab at Paul. John says, that's Paul again, the unfinished song, right? 
We're on Abbey Road, just a piece at the end. He had a line in it, and in the end, the love you get is equal to the love you give, which is a very cosmic philosophical line, which again proves that if he wants to, he can think. John is notorious for his critical comments on the Beatles' music, including his own songs, so his perspective on the medley can't be neglected in this video. John says, Abbey Road was really unfinished songs, all stuck together. Everybody praises the album so much, but none of the songs had anything to do with each other. No thread at all, only the fact that we stuck them together. I like the A side. I never liked that sort of pop opera on the other side. I think it's junk. It was just bits of songs thrown together, and I can't remember what some of it is. Come Together is alright, and some things on it. It was a competent album, like Rubber Soul. It was together in that way, but it had no life really. Although John had his issues with the medley, it has to be one of the most integral events to the entirety of the Beatles catalog, proving an unfinished song by the Beatles could carry with it enough charm and talent to create a musical menagerie on the B-side of an album. Each one having so much history and storytelling behind it, it truly shows the power of songwriting when you think outside of the box, and we are all so grateful. Man, Abbey Rose, such an incredible album and such a phenomenal medley. I wanted to thank you all for supporting the channel and getting us to 100,000 subscribers. Can you believe it? 100. That's incredible. And I'm just, really, just, words don't cover it. A little bit about me. My family is from Trinidad and Tobago, which is a tiny island off the coast of Venezuela. My parents, without a nickel in their pocket, immigrated with my brother to the States and had me. My dad often tells me, without provocation, that I was unplanned. I grew up in the Bronx in the 90s and we were quite poor. So poor in fact that we all had to sleep in the same bed till I was five or six years old. However, being the determined people they were, my parents achieved great success and altered the course of our family. Somehow or another, before high school, I managed to have not a single friend in the world, so I spent a lot of time on my own practicing music. My parents exposed me to the music of their generation, the Beatles, Cat Stevens, Eagles, and I found comfort in the optimistic vibe of the 60s. I was a poor student. My favorite class in Catholic school was religion, mostly because I enjoyed discussing philosophy and the humanity of people. I learned to sing in that church. I attended one of the most prestigious performing arts high schools in the Northern Hemisphere, LaGuardia in Manhattan, for theater, often nicknamed the Fame School, which has alumni ranging from Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, and all the way to Adrian Brody. I was a professional actor, doing commercials, off-Broadway performances, and a few stints on network television. Through the course of life, that was ripped away from me, and I found myself in the suburbs of Florida. I met the love of my life at a play. I would marry her years later at a zoo. I started a band. Then another, then another. We got close to something, working with a six-time Grammy award-winning producer who took us under his wing. But when the veil came down, he turned out to be a fiend, so I abandoned ship, and this resulted in years of working at my father's business, fixing cars. New York, acting, music, it was just a distant dream. The person I was and the promise I had made to my childhood self, I had failed to fulfill. I asked for a sign and was greeted with a catastrophic panic attack that upended my life. I went on a long road trip across the country to find myself in my old Mustang, and when I came back, I started this channel, and that brings us to today. We bought a forest and an antique home, a train ride away from Manhattan so I could pursue acting all over again, but unfortunately for most of us, the virus has put the brakes on this endeavor for now. But I made a new promise to myself that I knew I could accomplish. It's that whatever it is I'm looking for, I promise I'm going to die trying to find it. So that's the story of me. And here are some of my favorite clips from the channel. We've done a few covers. She's a kind of girl who throw my love away But I 
For this moment to be free, blackbird fly. A few scenes. They were so upset over the whole Yoko thing, and the fact that I was becoming as creative and dominating as I had been in the early days. I still had this "God will save us" feeling about it. That it's gonna be all right. That's why I did it. I wanted to talk. I wanted to say my piece about revolution. I, I wanted to tell you or whoever's listening. I wanted to say, what do you say? This is what I say. The yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains. Let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys. Slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. work with some of my best friends, having a laugh. Their undisputed masterpieces, Taxman, a song so catchy, most people probably don't listen to the lyrics. Release an album. <laughs> and been to many places. I'd like to thank my brothers Rishi and Josh, my mother and father and my wife's parents, best friends Brad for being my scene partner, Dan for producing my music, and Steph for putting us on the Abbey Road wall, Leah Robbins, our contributing author and social media manager, and of course my lovely wife Lindsay, who is literally the only reason this was possible. I thank you all for this opportunity to share my music, my interests, and the community that has welcomed me regardless of my many shortcomings. I don't know what the future has in store for me, but whatever it is, I know I will won't have to face it alone. I hope you enjoyed the video and thank you once more for this incredible milestone. See you next time.